Hello, good evening. My name is Ilaria Marchesi. I am uh, the director of the Classics program, and I have been given the honor of introducing uh, our, uh, the first speaker of the great writers uh, and great readings series for the spring semester. But before I do so, I want to invite you to the second and third reading. Uh, so on March 11, uh, uh, the reading with uh, Maxim Schreier, uh, the winner of the National Jewish uh, Book Award uh, in 2007 uh, for his anthology of uh, Jewish uh, Russian literature. And on April 1st, uh, Mary Norris, uh, the famous uh, uh, comma queen of uh, the New Yorker, okay? Uh, again, uh, 6.30 here, okay? So March 11 and uh, April 1st. But tonight, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing uh, a colleague uh, in uh, classics, uh, Professor Emily Wilson, uh, who is professor of uh, classics uh, and also of uh, comparative literature and translation studies at the uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And she's a mm, really prolific author uh, who started uh, with her first uh, book uh, uh, on uh, mortality in uh, the uh, tragic tradition uh, in 2005, with, with which uh, she um, won the prize of the American Comparative Literature Association. Then uh, she published another book on the death of Socrates. Uh, she published uh, uh, translation and notes of Seneca's tragedies uh, and the monograph on Seneca in 2014, uh, in addition to translations of uh, um, uh, Euripides' uh, tragedies uh, for the Random House anthology of Greek plays. Uh, so. Uh, and I'll stop, I will not uh, start uh, mentioning any of the articles, otherwise I will spend the evening here. But uh, the reason why uh, all our students are extremely excited to have her here uh, is uh, uh, her uh, famous and really uh, worldwide famous uh, uh, translation uh, of the Odyssey from uh, 2017, which uh, um, for which she was granted uh, the prestigious uh, MacArthur Fellowship uh, in 2019. And uh, um, that we have uh, used at Hofstra already in uh, several classes, uh, including uh, the about uh, 300 students of uh, culture and expressions two years ago. Uh, so everybody is very excited uh, to have her here. Uh, her translation uh, has been praised uh, for uh, really uh, making uh, Homer uh, uh, accessible uh, to a contemporary audience uh, for uh, the metrical and uh, musical uh, regularity and the vividness of uh, her uh, use of the iambic uh, pentameter. It's the first translation uh, to have uh, the same number of lines uh, of uh, the uh, original Greek. Uh, which wasn't easy to do. <laughs> um, for, uh, uh, I'm guessing, uh, obviously, for m marketing uh, strategies, uh, she is uh, known uh, uh, everywhere as uh, the first uh, uh, woman to translate uh, the Odyssey in uh, English, uh, which she doesn't really. Uh, like too much uh, uh, because uh, uh, she rightly feels that it uh, detracts uh, from uh, other uh, uh, women in classics uh, who have uh, in fact uh, translated the Odyssey in several of other uh, modern languages before. But we can, you cannot deny that it's the first in English. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, we, I mean, as long as we talk about Homer, uh, we are fine, uh, even uh, with uh, saying, <laughs> uh, even in insisting uh, the, on the fact that you were uh, um, the first woman to translate it, the first woman in English, OK? Uh, in fact, uh, the Odyssey has been translated in French even uh, 400 years ago with the prose translation. And there are translations by women in uh, uh, Italian, Greek, uh, uh, French, uh, uh, Dutch, etc. OK? But this is uh, um, the first one uh, uh, in English uh, after uh, uh, more than 60 translations uh, by men. So we can be happy about that too, <laughs> okay? So I don't want to um, steal uh, any uh, more time, so let me um, 
Welcome uh, Emily here. Uh, please join me. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm going to talk about the whole woman marketing at the end of the talk. So I, I would, it, would be, it would be fine if people have questions about that as well. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time to Hofstra. Um, so I, I'm going to um, combine some little bits of reading from the translation with quite a lot of talking. I hope it's not too lectury. Um, with talking about um, why did I re decide to retranslate the Odyssey at all? What did I feel was at stake in this project? Why would one take on the, what might seem like a completely pointless exercise of retranslating a poem which has already existed in multiple different translations already in the English language? Um, so this is just an outline of what I'm going to do in the course of the talk. So just so you know, um, it will be less than an hour. I'm going to try and pack a lot of different things into it. Um, so I'm just going to go through this um, narrative, which is going to include some discussion of translation, what's at stake in translation, and also some stuff about the Odyssey itself. Um, so I'm going to start by reading from my translation of the Odyssey, because I think one can't have a sense about, of what any piece of writing is, is like, um, including a translation, without reading it out loud. And I think that's especially important if it's a metrical piece of poetry. Um, the passage I'm going to choose to start with might seem like neither an end nor a beginning, but it's actually both. It's the moment from book 13 in which Odysseus um, comes home geographically to Ithaca. And I think if you haven't read the Odyssey recently, it may be startling to realize the journey home is super easy. Odysseus is fast asleep. It happens pretty fast. In fact, what the poet emphasizes is very quick journey home, and then he's done. Um, so I think if, we, if, you haven't, if you only, you've only been exposed to the popular culture, modern interpretations of the Odyssey, Odyssey with a small o means very long geographical journey. That's not what Odyssey with capital O suggests about homecoming. Odyssey with a capital O suggests homecoming is this very complicated thing which, of which the geographical location is a teeny tiny piece. There's a whole lot more to coming home than just being in a particular place. It's also all about relationships, which is probably why I was so happy that they didn't put a boat on the cover of my translation. So this is how Odysseus gets back to Ithaca transported from the land of his lovely, magical host, the Phaeacians, in their stealth-steering ship, which brushes through the water miraculously fast. A sound, sweet sleep fell on his eyes, like death. He did not stir. As four fine stallions rush at the whip and race their chariot across the track, heads high, an easy canter, so was the ship's prow raised. The seething waves of sounding purple sea rushed round the stern as she sped straight ahead. The swiftest bird, a hawk, could never overtake. She sailed so fast and cleaved the waves. She bore a man whose mind was like the gods, who had endured many heartbreaking losses and the pain of war and shipwreck. Now he slept in peace, and he remembered nothing of his pain. So I hope you can hear, even from that short passage, some of what I was trying to go for in this text. Um, I wanted to have, as the original has, quite a lot of alliteration, a lot of attention to the sound of words, the ways that the sounds of words may mirror the action that's going on. I did a lot of reading out loud as I was working on it, both of the original and of my own drafts in progress. I also wanted to honor the clarity of Homer, the way that the syntax of this poem in the original is very easy, simple, direct, it's not Miltonic in any way. It's not at all about sy subordinate syntax. It has this quick narrative pace and has this wonderfully precise, vivid ways of describing the material world so that even when what's actually happening is bizarre or otherworldly, in fact, there are no self-steering ships and there weren't, even in archaic Greece. But as you're in the passage, you should totally believe in it and you should believe in the physicality of that boat, that movement. I think the passage also illustrates something about the challenge of translating a very ancient text. Um, I have to carry my readers across these unfathomable distances of space and time, just like that magical boat. And I want, at least for quite a lot of the time, to be doing that with so much smooth, ostensibly effortless energy 
that the reader is kind of like the sleeping Odysseus. You don't quite realize what journey you're on. But I also then want some moments where the reader is going to be like Odysseus when he wakes up on Ithaca and he's bewildered. It's his home, but he has no idea where he is. It seems like the strangest place of all because Athena has disguised his home in this magical fog. He, does, he thinks he's in some even more bizarre place than all the other bizarre places he's been to. So I want the reader to have those moments of sort of time travel whiplash. I don't know if it's now or 3,000 years ago. Um, so I was asked to consider translating the Odyssey by an editor at Norton, a lovely man called Pete Simon, um, with whom I'd already been working for several years on the Norton Anthology of World Literature. Um, and I was excited to be asked because I've always loved this poem for the last 40 years. This is me 40 years ago, um, being Athena in the um, local primary school play and the one wearing the helmet, that, which doesn't look as impressive as I thought it was when I was eight, but I made it myself. I was very proud of it. And of course, I'm wearing my wristwatch because the Odyssey is all about time. So that's it was very appropriate. Um, and we're gouging out the eye of the headmaster. So it was a very satisfying experience because, of course, all kids want to gouge out the headmaster's eye, as, as well as I mean, everybody wants to dress up as a goddess. Um, so I've loved the poem ever since I was eight, and my relationship with the poem has, of course, changed over the course of the last 40 years. And one thing I love about the Odyssey is that it's also grappling with that question of whether am I the same person as, as this? Is that me? Is Odysseus the same when he's on Ithaca as the person he was 20 years before on Ithaca? Can you actually get back to being that? Is there a continuity between her and me? Or is that actually impossible? Is this fantasy about coming back home also a fantasy about being oneself forever? In what circumstances is that, is that either possible or impossible? I love that it's grappling in this very deep way on, with, with the question of what does home mean for different kinds of people? What does identity and community mean for different kinds of people? Um, how is home constituted by imagination and relationships as well as by space and, and by memory and grief and by these details of the physical world like food and clothes and trees and boats and moving through space? And I also love that it's a poem where at any moment a goddess is probably going to appear and swoop down and then you'll realize, oh, she's here again. And I love that. But of course, loving the Odyssey and wanting to keep on rereading it in Greek is not at all the same thing as thinking it's worthwhile to add to this huge pile of English um, translations of the Odyssey. Um, one could say there were far too many already and they're, they're also far too much similar to each other. And I do think that. I and mean, I actually think this is a growth industry and it shouldn't necessarily be. Um, so people have been translating the Odyssey into English for the last 400 years, um, starting with the great George Chapman, whose version is still one of the best. Um, and for the first 200 years, there was a relatively restrained market. There were only less than 10 out there. And then for the last 200 years, it's been going crazy. And there are so many, and there are even more you know, since 2000, the pace has been going up and up. So I really hesitated, should I actually add to this huge pile? I didn't think it was worth doing unless I thought I could do something different. I could go on loving the Odyssey quietly without bothering people about it. Or I could just write a monograph about it. I, I didn't actually have to do this. Um, so I, what I, I did uh, when I was asked to do it was do the exercise of very slowly rereading book nine of the poem, the one with the Cyclops, which is the one I've most often taught in translation and then very slowly reading something like a dozen English translations, like the most commonly used and taught um, versions that were available. And after doing that exercise and just thinking about what's available in English that, I, that doesn't quite capture what I most care about in the Greek, I then thought, actually, I do want to do this because I did feel there was something, there were certain things missing from the available translations that I hoped I could do somewhat differently. Um, and then after, that, after doing that exercise, I signed the contract and then I put the other translations away for the next five years because I didn't want to be influenced or counter-influenced by that. Um, so what motivated me to, to sign the contract was first of all thinking about poetic form. Um, as you all probably know, the, the Odyssey is composed all the way through in dactylic hexameter. Um, so a, for people who aren't classicists, um, a dactyl, or who aren't poets, the dactyl is a finger. So a finger has a long part and two short parts. If you're, I mean, if you're lucky enough to have complete fingers, that's usually what people have. Um, so it's la, la, la. And it's a hexameter, so there are six of those, six metrical feet. 
So it's andra moi ennepe musa polutropon hosmala polla. So it's six measures like that all the way through. And it seems to me that the music and the sound of the poem, the, the way that it's clearly designed to be performed out loud as a legacy of the long oral tradition through which both these stories but also these um, poetic phrases developed, that seems to me absolutely essential to the experience of reading it in Greek. So what do you then do you do about that in translation? It's a big question and there isn't an obvious right answer. One possible way to do it is just ignore meter altogether and do it in prose. And of course, there are many translations that do that. Um, another possibility is to use rhyming couplets. Um, the first translation that I mentioned before by Chapman does that, as does the one by Pope. I think they're both great translations, but they're also, um, by modern standards, not really translations at all. As you can see, even from the first couple of lines, the man, O muse, informed that many a way wound with his wisdom to his bushed stay. So you can see that Chapman is also great on the alliteration and that both Chapman and Pope introduce wisdom in the first two lines, even though the Greek has nothing whatsoever about wisdom. But we think it is, yes, it's got to be about wisdom because we want it to be about wisdom. Um, so I, I, a modern translator couldn't get away with that. And I think, for me personally, I think a contemporary 21st century translator can't quite get away with rhyming couplets. At least I didn't feel I could. Um, another option is to try to echo the rhythms of the original in English, so to use hexameters. The only translation I know of that actually is in hexameters is the Rodney Merrill ones of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Tell me, muse of the man versatile and resourceful who wandered. Which I think you can see even from just that little glimpse that it doesn't really work as English poetry. Uh, I think it's a wonderful um, virtuosic effort, but it's, I don't think it quite works. Another possibility is to use long lines that don't scan, but if you sort of squint, they might look like hexameter if you don't read them out loud. <laughs> and of course, that's also a very popular option. Um, an even more popular option is to use stacked, vo stacked prose or free verse. So it's laid out in a verse form, but it doesn't have a regular meter. And you can see that um, some of the most um, commonly read translations are in this category. And I, I also realize only now, uh, sort of in going back to them, having done mine, that you can also see how many echoes there are between these translations, um, even beyond the verse form or lack of verse form. So we have the wanderer, wanderer, we have plundered, plundered, we have time and again, time and again. So you can also see how even though there were almost 70 translations, many of them are very similar to each other, even beyond form. Um, so I, I felt that I didn't want to do um, non-metrical verse, and I didn't want to do prose, and so on. So what was left to me was iambic pentameter. I wanted to try and signal to the English-speaking reader, English-reading reader, that you're going to feel it as, re as regular metrical you want, you're going to want to read it out loud, which I think the only way to signal that very, very clearly is to use the same meter as Shakespeare and Milton. Um, so then another um, big formal thing that I wanted to do was to choose to use the same number of lines as the original. I was conscious in looking at other translations, not just of the Odyssey, but of pretty much any text you can think of, especially if it's a, it's a translation into English of a highly inflected um, language original, there's always that tendency to expand because a translator is always going to know this word in that language has no exact equivalent. So you're always going to have that temptation to think, let me just bung down five different words to cover all my bases. And you end up with a translation that's hugely longer than the original, even somewhat longer. And the pacing is totally different. It doesn't feel tight in the same way. It doesn't have that compulsive, I want to keep on reading feel. So I, I kept kicking myself for taking that on because it was so difficult. I would constantly be just one line off and I've almost finished with that book, but I've got to go back and revise the whole thing because I'm just one, one line off. But I think ultimately it was something I found very satisfying to try and be thinking constantly about pacing. Um, so a, a further sort of formal consideration that arises for every translator of Homer is what to do about repetition. Um, the Homeric poems are very repetitious because they're based on an oral tradition. So within a, a purely oral culture, it seems to me that people tend to value repetition. Repetition tends to be a mark of, we need to remember this. This is a very important phrase. This is the phrase that's handed down from your great, 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 great grandmothers. 
Whereas in a highly um, literate society like ours, I think repetition on the page has a very different set of meanings. It can mean you can skip this because you read it already and the writer's being lazy, which is not the way it feels in Homer. It doesn't feel that way. And it also doesn't feel the way that um, it feels if it's a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. It's a wonderful modernist experiment. That's not how Homer feels. So I felt that in, um, in experimenting with different ways to deal with repetition, I wanted to keep some definite sense of stable repeated components. There are wine dark seas, wine dark seas, some more wine dark seas. Dark quick ships, and they're going to keep on being pretty dark and pretty quick throughout the poem. Um, but I also wanted to create a language that would have some elements of shifting things around so that it felt alive to the literate English reader, who obviously was my reader. I can't write for the dead. Um, so, for instance, in the famous line about rosy-fingered dawn, um, which, of course, is a very important line, because, as I said about my wristwatch, the Odyssey is all about time. It matters whether this dawn is the same or different from a previous dawn. What's going to happen on this new day? Are all days the same? Are all, are all days different? There has to be some sense of it's both the same and different every day. So I used um, the same components, but I mixed them up, and which is a really fun thing to do. Just to, as a writing exercise, it was really fun just to think about how can I ensure that, God, that the goddess dawn always feels fully goddess-like. Goddess she always has roses or flowers, fingers or touching, but then I mix up those components. The question of verse form is related to larger issues about style and about equivalence. I wanted a readable, clear register, and I avoided archaisms. Like, I, I didn't feel I should just do the knee-jerk archaisms, which come about in a translation of an ancient text if all you do is plonk down the dictionary definition. I wanted to avoid um, show-off high rhetoric as much as possible, because that's not how I feel the Homeric poems as being stylistically. I know that some readers have labeled my translation style as modernizing or domesticizing or even colloquial at times. I think that's only part of the truth, even beyond the fact that we usually don't speak iambic pentameter all the time. There were other elements of artifice that I was definitely going for. I avoided all contractions like doesn't and don't as part of the impetus to try and create a register that was very reminiscent of real speech, but also always significantly different from real speech. Homeric Greek is actually a really weird language. It's not a language anyone ever spoke. Um, it's a mix of different dialects from different parts of the Greek-speaking world from different eras, which again is part, is part of the legacy of the oral tradition. It would have been really tempting to try to replicate that diversity um, by using a mix of Cockney and Glaswegian and Chaucerian English and Ebonics and California and they just throw it all in there and it'd be a wonderful Joycean thing and it, it would have fairly few readers but it would have been great for me um, <laughs> but it would also have meant that it, I would be, it would make it impossible to do all the other things I wanted to do such as convey how this is a deep human story and you're gonna, actually going to care about the relationships and the society. So instead, I wanted there to be just a few moments when the reader will be surprised by the language in one direction or another. I didn't want it all to feel totally the same or totally neutral. So when people say, I found one or two words in your translation jarring, I kind of feel happy about that. Because I, I want there to be some moments which are kind of like those moments of Odysseus waking up on Ithaca, where there is some sense of the language isn't all entirely the same cloth. Um, so. I think the things I've said so far are sort of circling around questions about what is translatorly equivalence. This is a super difficult both theoretical and practical question. I think it requires different kinds of responses depending on the pair of languages and pa pair of texts that you're dealing with. In the case of modern novels, which of course is the majority of translated books in the book market, um, I think there's an expectation of a fluent domesticizing style. So translation theorists talk about domesticizing versus foreignizing, which is a kind of simplistic binary, but they can be useful terms to start with. Um, so that there's an argument in translation theory that we need to push against that idea that translations should domesticize, and instead, shouldn't we try to um, recognize the foreignness of the, uh, of the foreign text by um, making it writing it in an English that's going to feel weird to the Anglophone reader. Um, and I think there's something to be said for that in that particular context, in the context of what are your expectations when you read a Japanese novel in translation. 
I think there are very different sets of expectations and therefore very different responsibilities for somebody translating an ancient and also ancient ultra-canonical text. Um, so there are preconceptions. On the one hand, we expect ancient epic um, to sound ancient. So it has to be archaic. Um, it should probably be unreadable if it's really authentic. It should be written in this weird, unidiomatic English, which is the only possible way to show this is a truly oldie timey sort of text which, again, I think is totally bogus, because, in fact, fake English is not the same as Greek, but that, that's one of, our, one of the expectations. <laughs> the other expectation is ancient epic must sound epic, which must mean it's, it's Whitmanesque or it's bombastic in certain ways. It's going to have dot, 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 exclamation mark. It's so epic. And it's going to also, both stylistically and then in terms of its interpretations, it's going to espouse this uncritical model of macho heroism, which is also going to be sort of... Pr it, it, which I would say is a particular contemporary American ideal that gets, gets projected back onto the ideals of archaic Greece. I think there's a further subset of issues with classics, because of course in classics, badly written translations are often highly valued in that they ostensibly replicate the experience of the struggling student in intermediate Greek or Latin class. So it's supposed to feel like a language you don't quite understand. Um, even if, in fact, once you get a little bit further on, it doesn't necessarily feel that way. Um, so my, my goal in, in trying to cre create a somewhat different style is not to say any of those interpretations are totally invalid, but just they're not the only possible ways to do it. Um, so I think in general, people, and this is even beyond classics, people have this idea about translation as um, it's like this is Hercules, um, choosing between, between two very similar ladies. But so the myth about Hercules is that he, uh, Hercules at the crossroads, he's um, had to choose between pleasure, who's the one wearing slightly fewer clothes, and <laughs> virtue, who's suggesting a healthy, healthy hike up the mountainside. I mean, sorry, vice, uh, vice is down there, ple vice or pleasure is down there wearing the fewer clothes. Um, virtue is suggesting the healthy hike. And this is this binary choice that you can either have a fun time with a poetic and enjoyable translation, but it's all lies and you should not be doing that. It's nasty. Or else you go for the virtuous thing, which is going to be very unpleasant, but you will feel really good about yourself if you can continue with it. And I think that's actually a really bad model for thinking about both translation and also literary interpretation. I don't think there's just two possible ways to read the Odyssey, in fact. There are multiple ways to read the Odyssey and multiple ways, therefore, to translate it. So I think it's better to think about translation much more in terms of there are multiple different possible ways to represent, um, to represent things. This is Cindy Sherman. Um, sorry, her name got cut off, but anyway, she's a contemporary artist and she, and she has a whole career's worth of self-portraits. These are all her painting herself. They're all different. Um, so I think translation, we can think of translation in terms of not do I do it correctly or do I do it in a fancy, pretty way? Do I tell a pretty lie or do I tell the ugly truth? I think it's a much more complex question about which truths do I want to tell out of the many, many, many true facts about the original text. I can't tell all of them. I can't tell every story. So one of the most important truths I wanted to tell about the Odyssey is that it's really fun and it's actually easy to read. It's designed for um, illiterate folk audiences who are listening to it voluntarily. It's a gripping human story about a family and about communities. It's told in this beautiful, regular musical rhythm in clear syntax. And at the same time as I want to say it's fun and simple, I also want to say it's complex and it's polyvocal, which might seem like truths that are in tension. I think they're both absolutely essential truths. Um, I've seen from teaching the, the Odyssey that there can be a tendency to see it as a sort of old school comic book superhero story about the unproblematically heroic male Western hero, implicitly white, who is good because he crushes the bad guys and monsters and foreigners and witchy women and understands the value of hospitality. You have to write down Xenia to get the A on the exam. That apparently was important for the ancient Greeks. And the story has the happy ending because the good guy gets back with the objectified wife and regains all the wealth and all the slaves. So it's a nice celebration of family values and consumerism and patriarchy and war, superiority of normal male white people over foreigners and girls. And I was emphasizing at the start that I really like this, this poem. I like the Iliad and the Odyssey a lot. And I like them even though I'm not eight years old anymore. And so I, I guess I, want just to, I wanted to emphasize in my translation that this is actually a poem for grown-ups. It's not just it's not something really babyish about the story I just told. And I wanted to emphasize in thinking about it and presenting it as a translator the way that it's 
really quite deep in this presentation of social relationships and the complex gaps between people's understandings of each other. The Odyssey explores two central Greek concepts. Um, so I, I apologize for people who've studied the Odyssey many times in the college, uh, college overview. So Nostos and Zenia are probably um, familiar concepts to many of you. I'm going to go quite fast through them, so it'll only take two minutes. Um, the first is Nostos, a word that means homecoming. And you might think that homecoming is a really straightforward thing. It just means getting back to where you, where you live. But of course, as we've already glimpsed in the piece I read at the start, the Odyssey explores a case where homecoming is as hard as it could possibly be. It's showing how there are profound questions raised by the concepts of coming home, being at home. Is it essentially exclusive? Do we create a home for ourselves only by keeping other people out or keeping other people subordinated or slaughtering other people if they happen to wander into our house and start drinking our wine? The second Greek term that's central for the Odyssey is xenia, which is the idealized relationship between strangers, hosts, and guests. In this code, people have a deep obligation to take care of strangers in need. It, it's a way of fa for families to form lasting friendships over great spaces of time and for many generations. It's in many ways inspiring, and especially in our time of xenophobia. And it's, in a way, it's a sad thing that xenophilia is not a particularly common word in our discourse. But the poem is also I mean, I, I, emphasizing how exclusive this code is. It only applies to elite men. When a woman travels, that's when you get Helen of Troy slash Sparta, not a good thing. And it shows how easily Xenia can go wrong as when the suitors act like bad guests invading Odysseus's home without asking, or Odysseus does the same thing to Polyphemus, and violence ensues. The original poem, I think, is compelling because of the nuance and complicatedness of its own um, core values and ideals, and how deeply it lets us inside the perspectives of so many different characters. Um, so just to emphasize complicatedness, I was very deliberate in choosing the word complicated in the first line because it seems to me that the, uh, the original term polythropos applies not just to the protagonist but also to the poem itself, to the way it tells its story, to its literary complexity, and also to, to the way that it's meandering in its journey and to the levels of complexity that are there in its presentation of a social world. So just on translation, I think one of the... Um, one key example for, of why, how, or why or how translators can be motivated to uh, reduce complicatedness. It's surprising to me to realize how little most translators use words like enslaved or slave, in, even in translating words in the Odyssey, which are clearly referring to enslaved people. I think that comes with a, with a desire to put things through Odysseus' perspective and present him as the quote-unquote hero in a modern sense, so we don't want him to be an enslaver, because that's not very nice. So, but, whereas I think there's a, there's a willingness on the part of the original poem to acknowledge this hugely multifaceted elements of the story, including the perspectives of those Odysseus kills and marries and betrays and enslaves. So I'm just going to read, the, read my beginning. And I think you can see even in the beginning how there's this emphasis on all those who don't make it back home. It's not just one man's story. It's so many people's story. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy, and where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea, and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed, and for their own mistakes, they died. They ate the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, Tell the old story for our modern times. So since publishing my translation, I've, I've looked at a few passages of mine next to other translations, and that exercise in itself has made me more, more aware of what a world of difference there is in the details of word choice, even when I didn't necessarily think I'm making a marked choice here. As of course, I didn't necessarily always think that. Um, it seems to me in several instances, translators seem to shape the narrative so we look more through Odysseus's point of view than I think we do. So for instance, um, a lot of English translators make Calypso seem like a hysterical nymphomaniac rather than like a powerful goddess with whom Odysseus willingly spends several years. Um, so she's a nymph in an English sense. I think it's a false friend linguistically. We think we're misled by the idea of nymph. We know what that means, even if you actually know that it doesn't mean that in archaic Greek. 
Similarly, I think there was a lot of projecting of modern colonial prejudice against indigenous peoples back onto Polyphemus the Cyclops, so that he's presented as a monster or a savage, rather than, the, I think, the quite complex depiction of him both as um, a gentle shepherd and somebody who's going to eat people alive once they wander into, into his home space. So th th there's a multifacetedness to the presentation, which I think can get eliminated by translation. So to illustrate how important I think point of view is, and this is, this is something which applies to translation, it's also something that I'm aware of in the case of Homer, much more because I've read now at logical readings of Homer than I think I would have been otherwise. I think this is building both on reading in general, thinking in general, but also on scholarship. Um, so I was going to talk in detail about one more passage as an example of how I worked to, see, worked to bring out um, the complexity of the, the Odyssey's um, point of view and its diversity of perspectives. So many translators make the narrator seem entirely to authorize and valorize the deaths of the 12 women who are usually called maids rather than raped slaves, whom Telemachus chooses to hang. Um, so the, in the, within the narrative, and I'm sorry both for um, spoilers and maybe more seriously for trigger warnings, because I think it's a very disturbing passage. Um, so for people who don't remember the story of the Odyssey, Odysseus does get home, as I already spoiled for you. And then after being in disguise as a homeless old migrant for a long time, he gradually reveals himself to the trusted members of his household, who of course don't include his wife. And with their help, um, he manages to slaughter all the suitors who've been, uh, who've been harassing Penelope for the last few years. And then once he's done all the elite men killing, he then delegates the final batch of 13 murders to his dopey man-child son, Telemachus, who up to this point hasn't done very much. So this is his big moment to shine, and he, he sort of takes advantage of that moment by not doing exactly as his dad tells him to do. Um, Dad tells him to hack the life out of them with long swords, um, even though Dad has also said at the start of Book 22 that these, these women were raped by the suitors. Um, so it's clearly not presented, at least not coherently, as a punishment. It's presented, I think, as an honor killing, which is about eliminating um, the property that's been soiled. So the property that's been soiled is the property that's been claimed by the wrong men. Once that's gone, the memory of this house was under other ownership is gone. Telemachus chooses, inst instead of the hacking thing, he doesn't like to touch the sword. We don't have to go too deep into what's going on there. Um, so he instead chooses to hang them. Um, so I'm just going to point to four translation areas that I think are really important for thinking about perspective and how perspective can be um, shifted differently by different translators. So first comes the way that the narrator introduces Telemachus right before he does this. Um, Telemachus is introduced as Pepnumenos. Tel Telemachus is always Pepnumenos because that's his standard Homeric epithet. And it suggests something or other about him having a thought or an idea or something or other going on in his brain. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing going on in his brain. It might be, might, who knows what's going on, but something's happening up there. Um, and uh, so um, if you then translate that epithet as thoughtful, it's clearly a, a positive attribute. That shapes the narrative, it shapes the narrator's perspective in a particular way. Even more so, I think, if, you sh if you'd have translated it as stern or sagacious. Um, so I, I wanted to try and make it uh, somewhat more neutral, as I think it is, potentially. Second choice is about um, the issue of what Telemachus says right before he commits these murders. Um, the, those lines um, give us whatever clues we might get about what, why does he think he's doing it. It seems to me that those lines have a lot of emphasis on his sense of shame. He feels, um, as a bullied young man who's grown up without a dad, um, he feels that this is the only way he can claw back his masculinity. He's, he's ashamed by their existence. A lot of translators seem to have a very different interpretation and to present it as if what he's doing is punishing sexual criminals. And in order to, to make that, that narrative clear, they add in a lot of abusive language, which doesn't have an exact co correspondence to anything in the Greek. So for instance, we have these creatures, beasts, trolls, sluts, you sluts, you whores, suitors whores, the suitors sluts, and so on. And then the Peter Green translation adopts the standard scholarly thing, just agonizing about how big would the rope have to be to kill that many women, which I think is kind of hilarious. That's, so that's, that's where, where, the, where the classicist minds go. Oh, I'm, I'm classed this too, so I should own that. Um, so I, 
I think it's not, that, it's not that the translators think I'm doing something illegitimate by putting the word sluts in there when it's not there in the Greek. They think they're following a particular interpretation. And I think once you're on a particular interpretive track, it can be hard to see this isn't the only possibility. Um, so third issue is what's happening in the simile. Does it dehumanize? This is great simile in which the um, narrator compares the women with a rope around their necks to birds caught in a trap. Um, it seems to me that quite a lot of, in, of the interpretations implicit in translations use that simile to emphasize it's like killing birds, it's like killing chicken, it's okay. We don't worry about this, it's not real murder. Whereas I think an alternative way of seeing that simile, which might, it might, not, be a, might not be a total alternative, maybe both are going on, um, is to say the birds have a motive. We see their point of view. We see that they wanted to go home. They wanted a nostos. They wanted to get back to their nests. I think it matters that in the Greek, the term for the bird's home is also used for human habitation. They're not, they're not totally just avine. They're also like, pe like big people. We can feel for those birds. And then final issue is um, what's going on with their final movement. Um, is it a voluntary or involuntary movement as these women are being murdered? And a lot of translators seem to make the women's final movements seem much more voluntary than they need to according to the Greek, I think. So for instance, their feet danced, they kicked up heels, so this is what happens to party girls. So I'm just gonna read my version of this passage and um, just emphasize that I think there are multiple different points of view here. So the, the, the poem is able to see this incident from different perspectives. Telemachus then took initiative, insisting, I refuse to grant these girls a clean death since they poured down shame on me and mother when they lay beside the suitors. At that he wound a piece of sailor's rope round the rotunda and round the mighty pillar, stretched up so high no foot could touch the ground. As doves or thrushes spread their wings to fly home to their nests. But someone set a trap. They crashed into a net, a bitter bedtime. Just so the girls, their heads all in a row, were strung up with the noose around their necks to make their death an agony. They gasped, feet twitching for a while but not for long. So I wanted, I, wanted to, I wanted it to be clear, as I think it is in the Greek, how painful, how pitiable these deaths are, and that we can understand exactly where Telemachus is coming from, and we can understand how it feels for the women as well. So since that passage is so disturbing, I thought I should um, end my discussion of the Odyssey on a cheerful, more, more, slightly more cheerful note. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, the final bit I'm going to read from the Odyssey is the bit that um, some readers in antiquity thought should have been the, the proper ending of their whole poem, which is when the husband and wife finally get back together. And as you'll remember, in this recognition scene, um, Penelope sort of tricks Odysseus by pretending to have moved his, the supposedly immovable bed that he built himself out of the tree growing up through the middle of the house. Um, and I guess what, what I want to emphasize before reading us a shortened version of that passage is that it seems to me that there's more than one point of view in that passage too. I think there's a tendency in the scholarship on, on Penelope as well as in translation to subsume Penelope's point of view into that of Odysseus. So it's a happy ending for her because she loves marriage. Isn't that what m women like? As opposed to seeing that marriage means something totally different for the two of them. As you can see very clearly in the fact that he's constantly using I pronouns I made this bed, it's my bed. I made it all by myself. Whereas she uses the dual and the plural. Um, if only we could have been together, but now this bed is marked by tears, it's marked by abandonment, it's marked by the grief I've been feeling for the last 20 years. It's a very different bed for the two of them. So this is the moment in which um, they reunite. She burst out crying and ran straight towards him and threw her arms around him, kissed his face and said, now you have told the story of our bed. You made my stubborn heart believe in you. This made him want to cry. He held his love, his faithful wife, and wept. As welcome as the land to swimmers when Poseidon wrecks their ship at sea and breaks it with great waves and driving winds. A few escape the sea and reach the shore, their skin all caked with brine. Grateful to be alive, they crawl to land. So glad she was to see her own dear husband, and her white arms would not let go his neck. 
So I love the way that, that simile flips the perspectives around, that you're going both from his perspective, it seems like it's his perspective, he isn't he the one who was shipwrecked, but then it turns out to be something else. So I'm going to spend like two minutes just talking about the reception of my translation and the whole first woman thing. Um, and then I'm going to spend two minutes talking about other translations in the Iliad, and then I'm hoping we're going to have some time for Q&A. Okay, so the, the whole first woman thing, um, I was honored by the whole lovely reviews and delighted that that coverage um, brought some much needed attention to issues that I think a lot of general readers and, and also scholars, including classicists, don't think about nearly enough, um, such as the fundamentally interpretive nature of not just translation, but also all writing, all scholarship, journalism, historiography, and so on. The need to model and encourage far more diversity in the fields of classics, history, poetry, translation, etc. Um, I think gender, along with a zillion other social identities, does make a difference to any interpretive work. I think if the coverage invites, encourages more young people to feel empowered and engaged with poetry in the ancient world, yay, that's great. So I was going to go through, but I'll just show you how many headlines had the word woman in them. Woman, 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 woman. Could the Odyssey have been the work of a woman? No. <laughs> that version of, so I, I was really happy when there were the occasional headline that didn't have the word woman, but it was very, very, very much the minority that didn't have the word woman. So yay for diversity, yay for more awareness of, trans of, um, in, of social identity and interpretation. That's all great. So I was going to make four points that I think should be sort of caveats about all of that. Um, first is tokenism. Um, I kind of worry about the erasure of other women's work and the, the coverage can focus on me as if I was unique and also me as if my, my interpretation or my reading of Homer is identical with that with any, of any every other woman. Uh, in fact, it's not. I mean, in fact, I am quite different from the, a whole bunch of other female Homerists even, as well as other women in the world of whom there were really quite a lot. Um, <laughs> I think it's kind of crazy. Um, I think also that we need to remember that being female in itself doesn't guarantee that you care about gender whatsoever, doesn't guarantee that you have a female perspective, doesn't guarantee that you're going to be a feminist. If you've read um, Madame uh, Anne Dacier's French prose translation of um, the passage I, I just talked about at length, the hanging of the enslaved women, Dacier is very much down on those women because they're really horrible non-bourgeois women and they're, they're kind of bad, they're the, the exact kind of servant you don't want in your house. And she adds in a whole lot more abusive language against them. So it's not that it's because I'm a woman that I think, I think the way I do think about particular passages. It really doesn't follow. Um, so then third related thing is that um, men have gender too. And I think it's a problem that they never get asked about it. I've read some other interview, interviews with other Homer translators, and none of them ever got asked, you know, you must really like the male characters. How is it for you as a man have, doing an epic poem? Whoa. <laughs> and I, was, I got those translations, those questions almost every time. In some version or other, those were the questions. And I think we should start asking men those questions and stop asking women. And then the final issue is that I think the headline is the wrong headline. Um, I don't think the press was wrong to, to think there was a headline there, but I think the, the headline is, why are almost all Greco-Roman translations into English by a particular category of old white guy? That isn't actually the whole of classics even. Um, so I think, you know, compared to translation as a whole, translation as a whole is under-recognized, underpaid, so of course it's female-dominated. Classics as a whole is not as male-dominated as classics translation is. I think that's a whole other set of issues, which is what we should be engaged with, rather than why is Emily Wilson a woman? Um, I, think, <laughs> I kind of dream of the day that there will one day be just as many terrible, badly written, clunky, thoughtless translations of Greek and Roman classics by women as there already are by men. <laughs> so now I'm just going to do the final thing is to, is to make a final point about translation in general, which is that ideally translators have to be chameleons. In translating the Odyssey, I wanted to convey, as I said, something of the polyphony of the poem. It's wide, social, geographical, tonal, stylistic range. Um, it's sometimes playful, often magical spirit. I very much didn't want my translation of the Odyssey to sound anything like, if possible, my translations of Seneca, who I think is a very, very different kind of stylist. I didn't want my Sophocles, I just finished a Sophocles, Oedipus Tyrannus, I didn't want that to sound anything like my Euripides, because I think the style of the original is totally different. Um, so now I'm working on the Iliad, 
And I'm thinking really hard about how I can make sure that the mood of that poem doesn't feel the same as the mood of the Odyssey. It's a much more intensely claustrophobic poem. Um, and I'm just going to read as a taster before I open for whatever questions people have. Um, the beginning, which, like the beginning of the Odyssey, it tells you something about what the whole poem is about. It's about the terrible deaths caused by male aggression, desire for status, the mysterious wishes and actions of the gods in this intense plot where it's not clear where one action ends and another begins. Goddess, sing of the cataclysmic wrath of Peleus' son Achilles, cause of so much suffering for the Greeks that sent many strong souls to Hades, making men a feast for birds and prey for dogs. The plan of Zeus was moving to its end beginning when those two argued first, Lord Agamemnon and glorious Achilles. Okay, let's we'll stop there. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, we'll <laughs> <laughs> I gotta hurry up. Yes, <laughs> it's gonna take a while. <laughs> Yes, that would be great, yes. You guys got, must have questions, come on. <laughs> and I know, I did lots of questions this afternoon, so you may have used all your questions. But yes. Yeah, one of, it's, it's been a few years since I've <coughs> read the Odyssey, but one of my favorite parts uh, is close to the part that you just talked about where Penelope and Odysseus are together at. Yeah. Uh, no, I, what I think you might be remembering is that um, in book six, when Odysseus is chatting up Nausicaa, the Phaeacian princess, who's going to save him from being naked and shipwrecked and penniless by um, taking him to her rich mom and dad, and they'll load up with the magical self-steering ship that he, that, and all the, all the lovely gifts. So when he's chatting her up, he gives an um, image of the perfect marriage to this girl that he's certainly not going to marry, but he's going to give her, lead her on a little bit so that she'll then do the right thing. And, he, and in that passage, he's, he gives an idea of um, the ideal, of course, is when the husband and wife are together in the house with homophosuna, with like-mindedness. That's the only time the, part, the, the word is used. A lot of scholars, and I'm really surprised by how much this happens uncritically in the scholarship, sort of then project Odysseus uses this word when he's chatting up Nausicaa. That must be the image that the whole, whole poem has of marriage, which I think is really very doubtful. I think that's the image that Odysseus presents in that particular context. I don't think we're led to believe that um, the, the way that Penelope's friend or that her mindset is actually necessarily all that like Odysseus's mindset. She has a very complex mindset, and he has a very complex mindset, but are they exactly the same? I really don't think they are. Uh, that's. Um, yeah. I'm. Uh, no, I was. Uh, the my my question doesn't uh, doesn't follow up well. Well, I I, uh, I I'm in the department of writing studies and rhetoric, and that's something that comes up a little bit with um, with Alexander in particular. So I was wondering if there was something in between that. But it's. I I appreciate your response a lot. Thank you. Oh, sure. Yes. Hi, I'm a huge fan of the translation, um, but you. also of your Twitter account. And um, <laughs> I, I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about the Twitter account because when I see what you're tweeting, um, for instance, my favorite, um, I'm an early modernist, and so the Chapman mm -hmm. commentary is just amazing. Um, and seeing what he did well yeah. that other translators mm -hmm. didn't do, especially the, the bit about the sirens. Um, yeah. It was really amazing to see that. And so as a person following you on Twitter, I, I see the value of using Twitter um, and also as a, a way to give extra notes on the translation. Yeah. Um, just as an, it's really great to engage with that. But could you talk about what you get out of Twitter and mm -hmm. interacting with people who are reading your translations and how your experience is? Because as, as you know well, it's the worst place and the best place. Yes. That's true, yes. I, I, so I joined Twitter in order to be able to talk to people about the Odyssey. And I, so I, 
I had always just thought there's nothing for me there. It's not. <laughs> it's just gonna you know it sucks you in and it's, there's nothing. Um, but then I sort of realized um, I realized both that there was a lot of me media coverage of this translation when it came out, and that I wanted to have some kind of voice just to make what I thought were actually quite simple points. I mean, in a way analogous to the points I just made in lecture form about uh, sometimes people seem to be saying um, either for good or ill my translation is an interpretation. And I sort of thought, well, yes, and all translations are interpretations, and can I just demonstrate that to you by showing you some little bits? And I thought, thought this actually is, because the, the, the tweet has such a lovely, satisfying limit to it that you can do just three lines, and then you can do another three lines by someone else, and you can sort of force people to do close reading by juxtaposing different bits of three lines. And um, so I sort of realized, in fact, that kind of classroom exercise, which is a really one of the most fun classroom exercises anyway, could be done in that form. Um, it's, so it, it's, it's exciting for me because it's a way of doing a sort of something which is not quite writing an essay and not quite teaching a class, but it's, it's analogous to both those things. Um, I find it really absorbing also because I always find out something new. I mean, I always feel that when I, um, when I haven't read the entirety of hardly any of these sev almost 70 translations, but just that process of dipping into, I wonder what people did with this, that, or the other passage, and then I go and find out, and there's usually something interesting in that. So it's, it's fun for me just to do that sort of basic research thing, and then also to, to realize that there is a huge audience for it. I think that's really exciting just to realize, because I think many of the people who follow me on Twitter are not necessarily classics majors or even humanities people, but it's a way of sort of telling a wider public and engaging with a wider public about close reading matters and periods other than the present matter and poetry matters and translation is really interesting and I sort of want to be able to demonstrate all that rather than just say yay translation which nobody's going to believe if I just sort of show them this is exciting maybe there's a way to do that I mean right now it's hard for, it's hard for me to figure out exactly where I am with Twitter because I'm in the, I'm in the middle of working on the Odyssey and as I was saying, I don't like to look at other translations while I'm working on mine. So I can't quite do that model of Twitter yet. You know, I, I may just have to have some kind of Twitter hiatus, which is actually okay. It's <laughs> kind of nice. <laughs> yes. Yes. Hi. Um, you spoke briefly oh, so about, oh, about the, uh, the idea of translation in the, in the conversation. You spoke about the violence of translation. Mm -hmm. Here you spoke about the idea of the ship model. If you, if you rebuild a ship, completely bit by bit is it the same ship yeah how do you f what kind of responsibility do you feel you owe the civilization as a translator of a text that has no contemporaneous society there is yeah. like there is no longer an ancient greece and the same thing translating from latin as opposed to a translator of murakami who is translating the work of some of a culture that is still extant yeah i mean i think in a way it's an even deeper responsibility but i also know that um I, mean, I don't think there ever was an individual called Homer, and I also, I'm not sure. I mean, it's difficult, right? Because of course, the Homer, especially the Iliad, is so much all about the honor we owe to the dead. And I know I, I, I do feel that as a sacred honor, but I also don't think that's the only honor. I mean, I think people can sort of get distracted by, I have this deep responsibility to the, to the original, and then not think about, I also have these other competing responsibilities. I have my responsibility to the text I'm creating, um, the original is not going to stop existing. Even if I frame it as a violent thing, it's not like I actually killed Homer. And Homer is unkillable. Homer's already dead, has been dead for quite a long time. So I, I'm conscious of it both as a potential for uh, anxiety inducing, but also as, as something liberating about that. I mean, I can, I can play around with it. I'm not going to be the only source for Homer for the rest of civilization. Um, it's OK. I mean, if, if, if you don't like my Homer, then you can read a different Homer. Um, and if Homer doesn't like it, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love to have a chat with him about it, or her, or them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Again. Um, so I, I wanted to know, um, do you just start translating from a scene that you like or do you just start translating from the beginning like is it just like oh i really like um 
Persephone, like, in this light, let me, like, write her like that, you know? And then mm -hmm. and you start from that, or you just sort of, like, yeah, I'll just start translating. <laughs> yes. So with the, with the Odyssey, I, I, did the, I did book nine first because I did that. I had to do a book proposal to see if Norton wanted to sign me up. So they had to you know, send it to lots of different readers. So I had to do a sample passage. I chose book nine because I thought that was a good test case about different perspectives because it's when Odysseus is giving his own narrative. So I wanted to try and explore both um, how does the narrative shift between different points of view and also you know, there's some great description with the bashing of the brains and the crunching of the bones and all that, so, and the sizzling of the eye. So I wanted to have, I wanted to do all that stuff. Um, and so then I did book nine, and then with the Odyssey, I thought, so I've got that piece of the wandering book, so I'm just going to go through and do books five through 12. And then I went back to the beginning after that, but I had a sort of hiatus because one year when I was working on it, it was the Penn has a humanities forum, and it was the year of violence. So I did book 22 pretty early on because it was the most violent. Um, but then uh, with the Iliad, I just I've, I'm started at book one because there was no particular reason not to. And I know I've got to do it all eventually, so I might as well just start with book one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um. So you said earlier that um prior translations of the Odyssey have been like, kind of hyper-masculine, hyper-militarized. Um, do you think that your kind of unbiased, um, maybe like you said, neutral uh, translation, your interpretation, do you think that's um, kind of what we need now in our current political climate? Do you think that your translation will have any, I don't want to say like effect, well, that's, uh -huh. no, 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 that <laughs> yes. you won't have any effect, but like, do you think that your translation is kind of a response to what's going on now? Uh -huh. you, um, yeah. Yes, kind of. I mean, I think, I do think it's possible to be, you know, to, to speak from no point of view at all or to, to not be a person as, when you're working on something. Um, I mean, I, I use the word more neutral about a particular word choice. I don't think in general it's possible to respond to literature in a sort of, with no feelings. And I also don't think that's the ideal even. I don't think you can't understand it unless you're, having some feelings and having some thoughts and fully engaged with your whole self, including the whole self that's intellectual and critical and reading the commentaries and the dictionaries and testing your feelings. Um, but I, I, I mean, I do think, I think I, I feel more strongly now than I did, you know, 10 years ago that the Odyssey is at least very proto-political and that it's so, so many of the issues that it's about are so relevant in terms of how do we, um, is it possible to have a community that includes multiple different types of people, or does that just mean there's a top guy who's slaughtering most of the other people or keeping other people down? Um, I mean, I think it's also really interesting that um, it's a standard political candidate response to, like, what's your favorite book? Either they say the Bible or they say the Odyssey, you know? <laughs> and I think um, Pete Buttigieg apparently says the Odyssey, but I think a bunch of the others, oh, he said the Ulysses, actually. Anyway, so a bunch of them say, these big books, they tend to sort of have a particular p political resonance. And of course, like the big books classes, like uh, of the type that you guys have, those big book cl books classes can be implicitly sort of Western canon, um, white people are better kinds of narratives. Or they can be critical about those narratives and be breaking those things down. And I think it's really important just to be really conscious, even, even for translators, let alone T teachers and everybody taking those classes just to be having those conversations about what exactly are the things that we are bringing from our culture onto these um, very ancient texts. How are these ancient texts both being appropriated now? How, how is that different from the ways that they've been appropriated by earlier cultures? What's at stake in reading Homer for us now? Um, I, I mean, I guess I'm not sure what to say about the whole military thing. I mean, I think there is a there's an element in both the Homeric poems, both the Iliad and the Odyssey, of um, people glory in violence and win glory by violence. And celebration of violence is part of the aesthetic and the narrative. But then there's also absolute awareness of the pity, and, uh, pity of war and the horror and terror of war and how many people suffer because these guys want more status. Um, so I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's just one element of that. I think the, the whole way that the Odyssey is, is so multi-perspectival, I think that's actually a really crucial sort of political intervention potentially, just to, to realize you may think you can see all, everything from your tiny little vantage point, but maybe you can't. 
on a little lighter note, um, of all the characters in uh, this, uh, the Odyssey, um, besides Odysseus, <laughs> is there one particular character that you think you'd like to expand on? Not here today, but like if you were to do some historical fiction or something a little slightly different, like uh -huh. uh, was it Madeline Miller did Cersei, or is there yes. somebody? Yes. Which one would it be? A little lighter. Uh, yes. Um, I guess. Um, so there's several different good options, I think. Um, I mean, I guess the, the, the family of um, Dolon, Melanthio, Melanthius, the quote-unquote bad slaves, the, I mean, the, the slave woman who has been raised like a daughter by Penelope and has the cheek to act like a human being and talk to her, who's one of the women who gets hanged in this scene, and, and her brother, Melanthius, who has his hands beat. Oh, this, I, you wanted lighter, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay, no, let me not go there. No, it's going to be. Um, Odysseus also has a sister who's mentioned only once in the Odyssey called Timony. I think it would be a, like a good premise for a historical novel to write the story of Odysseus' sister. Yeah. Um, when it comes to deciding, like, when you start your translation for not just the Odyssey, but for any of the work you've done, do you sort of have a moment where you set out? You know, this is what I'd like to focus on in my translation, these themes specifically that I'd like to explore that might, that are important to me or that I have a lot to like say on, or do you just kind of, as you discover? I discover, I mean, I'm, I feel like I can much more clearly now after trying to talk about it for a while after <laughs> it was published, now I can tell you what the themes were. But uh, while I was actually doing it, I don't think I could have done exactly. I mean, not with the kind of clarity that I can now. It, it was all very much emergent and a sort of process of discovery. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, no, I feel very important. You're important. <laughs> I was going to ask, since you did um, the Odyssey and now you're working on the Iliad, are, have you realized, have you, are you taking like a step back from major translations or is, this, is there another major translation you want to work on? Or like, are you going to take a hiatus or not? I'm, I'm, so I signed up to do both the Iliad and uh, um, some Plato, so I'm going to be doing translation for a while. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much.